In January, I get like super organized and I make my lists and I get my calendars out and they're all fresh and exciting. I'm, I'm weird that way, but I get really excited to make calendars and lists and be organized. <laughs> today we are finishing in our series on trust and today's topic is on trustworthiness. Are you trustworthy? Does anybody remember being in like elementary school or even high school and the teacher would say, I just have to leave the room for one moment. I'll be right back. I never know exactly what they did, but I can think of many times that this happened, but one time in particular. I was in computer class in high school and the teacher says, I just have to run down the hall. I'm gonna be right back. Continue working. Well, there's two types of kids in the school, right? There's the good kind that say, okay, I'll just continue working. And then there is um, the visionaries, <laughs> the ones that maybe some call rebels, but I mean, that can't be right. So as soon as the teacher leaves the room, my friend and I look at each other and go, Hmm, I'm a little hungry. So we head down to the vending machine, go behind the stairwell, and we're having a good time eating our snacks until suddenly, over the PA system throughout the entire school. Alicia and Katie, please return to room 103 now. Alicia and Katie to room 103. Uh-oh, <laughs> busted. Well, I don't think I'm going to be trusted with that again. You may have been the rule follower and just continued t doing what the teacher had told you. Or maybe you were the visionary like I was. <laughs> Trustworthiness. The ability to be relied upon. To be trusted. Today we're going to look at a parable in Matthew 25. It's the parable of the three servants. It's also known as the parable of the servants. It's also known as the parable of the money bags, but it's the parable of the talents. And it comes after just a time when Jesus is preaching and he has just taught on the parable of the 10 virgins. And he's speaking concerning the kingdom of God. So you'll notice in the first line, in verse 14, it'll say, again, and that again is because he's reinforcing what he just said in the first parable to make sure people are really getting it in the second parable. So, Matthew 25, verse 14, the parable of the talents. Again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two talents. And to another, one talent each according to his ability. Then he went on a journey. The man who had received five talents went at once and put that talent to work and gained five more talents. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid it. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and he went to settle his accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought another five. Master, he said, you entrust me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrust me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bank. 
so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take that talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. Sounds a little harsh at the end, doesn't it? So this is how I often do it when I'm reading my, my Bible. I will read it through once and then I start reading through it again and start dissecting it. So that's what I want to do here today. And so we'll read it through again and we'll just start taking apart all the words and the meanings and, and see what that means to us. So verse 14, again, it. The word it here is referring to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, right? He was referring to it in the ten virgins, and now he's also referring it to the parable of the talents. They're both the same thing. So it will be like a man going on a journey. Now, this word journey, it's also important. Journey, right? You start in one place, you go away, and then you come back again. That's the idea of a journey. The man in the parable is going away, but he plans on coming back. And he just needs someone to take care of a few things just for him, just for, for the why he's gone. This is what Christianity is like. I mean, it is a journey. I did grow up in church, and the church sometimes seemed really focused on me being perfect or good or following these rules of Christianity. But it's just so much more than that. So much more. Because getting to the kingdom of heaven, it's a journey. It's an adventure. The common story themes that we've been told throughout history, like in our, our movies, in stories that we tell one another, they're the same ones are told over and over again, aren't they? Like every horror and suspense film ever made is like this overcoming this, mass, this monster. And they overcome it and, and everything's good again. Or then you have those typical like rags to riches kind of stories. Those are your Cinderella's, your Annie's, um, your August Rush even. The rags to riches. But the biblical story, also a story that's been told for thousands of years, the biblical story is to be understood as this journey. Like the parable is saying, these are the movies like Narnia, Lord of the Rings, Back to the Future, Indiana Jones. It's a journey. So in this story, this man, we assume he's very wealthy, and in some translations it does state that he's a very wealthy landowner, is going on a journey. So he calls all his servants together. That's Jesus calling us together and saying, come here, my disciples. Come here, Israel. Come here, my church. I'm entrusting you. I am giving you this property while I'm away. He entrusted me. Can we just take that in for a moment? God entrusted me with his property. I don't know about you, but some days I like walk out the door and I go, pants, check, shirt, check. Oh, we're good to go. I'm a little bit of a mess. Maybe you're nothing like that. Maybe you just have it all together. But I'm a bit of a mess. He entrusts us, not because of us, but in spite of us, because of his goodness. Have you noticed in our society this like radical, radical socialism, activism that happens? with young people, middle-aged people. They're just so passionate. You're so focused on this purpose. Well, human beings are all looking for something, right? That's why there is this radical socialism. The thing is that they're looking for a cause, something to die for. And the biblical story is way more like Lord of the Rings than it is like how you shouldn't eat sugar and organic is really good for you kind of documentary. Like yawn it's like lord of the rings 
slaying dragons, monsters, and evils, and overcoming the world for humanity. Doesn't that sound a lot more fun? I think so. We all need to die for something. We all want to die for something. You have, to, you have to give people a vision. It's not okay to make sure everything's in order and we're following the Christian rules and we're being like really good and stuff. No, it's this radical, this rebellious, this life transforming journey. Think of it for a second. Frodo Baggins, right? Lord of the Rings. He's been told he needs to go on this journey. So this guy is like the least likely hero in all of our hero stories ever. It, it's not gonna be Frodo, but it is. He has to go on a journey and leave everything behind. He has to travel to the deepest, darkest, most evilest place on earth to save humanity. This wizard, he comes for a little while to help him on his journey, but then he leaves. He says, you can do this. Frodo leaves behind everything. He leaves behind his friends, his family, maybe, maybe his sex life, maybe his career, maybe the beer in the Shire, all for this quest. So when we think about Christianity, that's what it's like, this invigorating, passionate journey. So that's our story. But he entrusts us with this now, not just in this parable. A couple of weeks ago, I went away with, um, with my husband's family to a cottage, and we have a few nieces and nephews, and we had just pulled into the cottage, and my like, four-year-old niece comes running up to me, and she has in her hand this toy cat. And she's like, doesn't say a word, but has the most proud look on her face. Like, here, I had totally forgot. I had given her this my toy cat to look after, and she's returning it to me. I got it for Mother's Day, and I don't play with it maybe as much as she would, so I thought I would entrust this to her. I said, oh my goodness, thank you so much for returning my cat. Did you look after her? She just nods silently, but so proudly. Did you end up naming her? Smokey. I'm like, oh, thank you so much, and she runs away and never talks about it again. Well, I start talking with her mother, and she's like, did she give you that cat back? And I'm like, yeah, she did. She goes, she carried that thing around everywhere. She fed it, she pet it, pretty sure she bathed it. <laughs> like, she just, she looked after it as if it was a real, live thing. God entrusts us with more than a toy cat. However, sometimes caring for something someone else has entrusted us with doesn't always go that way. We don't always take that same care. Like there was this one time where someone entrusted me with a car. And while I might have been much younger, much younger, I might have taken a corner a little too tight I might have went through a fence and wedged it between a house and a fence just missing the gas on the side of the house. Might have. I was much younger. So we don't always take care of something as well as we should, right? God entrusted his property with us. And this question of this text then is, what have you done with what he entrusted us with? What are you going to do with it? And I mean, if you've made a mess of it up until this point, don't let this parable like completely destroy you and go, oh my goodness, what have I done with my life? No, let it give you hope. Let it give you that passion. Okay, back to the story. I mean, this is probably why it takes me so long to do devotions is because I, you know, this is what happens. Verse 14, it will be like a man going on a journey, right? Lord of the Rings, going on a journey. He's called his servants together. He's entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two talents. And to another, one talent. Each according to his ability. 
Now, don't let this word talent like confuse you and think of like your music talent or like your really administrative talent. No, it's not talking about that. It's talking about money. Talents equal money in this story. The wealthy, gave, wealthy man gave money to each one of his servants. And it wasn't like a little bit of money. Some scholars say like five talents was like a million dollars. Other scholars have said that it's like three months worth of wages. Whatever it was, it was a lot of money for them to be entrusted with. So he gives them these talents, this money. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on this journey. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more talents. So also the one with the two talents gained two more talents. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and his master's money. Notice a couple of things in these verses. Verse 15, the man gives, God gives according to our abilities. He says, I have wired you in a way that you will be evaluated according to your ability. Like, what does this mean? It means stop comparing yourself to each other because he has wired each of us differently. I mean, Psalms 139 says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You wired me together in my mother's womb. So it means we don't have a choice with what we've been given. We don't have a choice of our abilities. When I was a single mom, I, um, I was probably a single mom for like eight and a half years or so. I completed two diplomas and I did a bachelor's and I worked and I volunteered and I had a house to maintain and my son. But the common question that you always got asked was how do you do it all? How do you do all this? I mean, I can barely make dinner and like go to work all day and come home. Like, I don't understand. It's simple. We are all wired differently. I mean, each of us will rise to the occasion in any situation in life because it's the way we are wired, because we're in that situation for a reason. But God works through us differently in our lives. So abilities, abilities. We all have different abilities. Therefore, these servants were trusted with different amounts. That's why they were given different amounts, because it was according to their ability. So the first servant, he walked in, and he had just such gusto, such ambition, such drive and enthusiasm. And the master was like, wow, this is going to be a good investment. I'm going I'm to give you five, five talents. Here you go. See, see what you can do with those. The second servant, he walked in, and he worked really hard, and he worked long hours, and he was a good guy. Maybe he just had a little bit less ambition, maybe a little bit less enthusiasm. So the master said, oh, this is a good servant. I'm going to give him two talents. I'm going to see what he can do with that. That's great. The, the last servant, he walks in. He's about two hours late, like just rolled out of bed, bed head galore. And the master said, okay, okay. Well, I'm going to give him one talent then. I'm going to give him one. That, that's, that's how it works, right? It's according to our ability. Based on who we already were, based on how he wired us. That's why we can't compare ourselves, our marriages, our jobs, our kids, because we're each wired differently. Now, a running joke in our family is math skills. Math skills. It's a running joke because apparently I'm not very good at them. I am good, apparently, and I'm well known for my cooking, apparently but not my math skills. I mean, if you start talking numbers to me, all that happens in my head is does not compute, does not compute. But I'll sit there with like a smile on my face as you talk to me in numbers. But I have no idea what you're saying. My husband, on the other hand, you provide him with any math question and in like five seconds flat, he has like the answer, here it is, and it's right. He's even admitted to actually playing with numbers in his mind. I don't even know what that means, 
but he's like, he randomly counts things or like goes up by certain like amounts. I don't understand. Playing with numbers? Who does that? Anyways, when we end up comparing ourselves, it's not right or wrong, right? It's just different. It's the wiring. So thinking or saying things like, why? Why then have I only been trusted with one talent? Why am I the one talent guy? Because he knows your ability. He gave you these resources based on the natural ability that he made you with in the first place. So more importantly, is what are you going to do with the talent that you've been given, the money that you have been given, the time that you have been given? Are you gonna skip out on computer class when the teacher's not watching? Or are you gonna use what he's given? Okay, verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and he settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrust me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Notice here that his effort, his efforts equated to his faithfulness. That's what it's equated to. He was faithful in bringing a return on the master's investment. He had been trustworthy. I trusted you with this little bit and you've done such a great job. I'm going to trust you with so much more. Verse 22, the man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well, then, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. And then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. <coughs> and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. Notice the tie here to other parables that Jesus has spoken. The gathering, um, the sowing and the gathering of the not scattered seed. That that's significant that they're, they're tying back to other parables because the Bible, it all works together with each other. Verse 26, his master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I harvest where I'm not sown and you and gather where I'm not scattered seed? Well then, you should have at least put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this is used many times in the Bible. It's in reference to the end times. It's in reference to God's judgment on us. As the master passed judgment on his servants, God will pass judgment on us. We will either be seen as a trustworthy servant, or we won't be. We're all going to be evaluated at the end of our life. So here's the simple draw then from this passage. What have you done with your life? Have you been trustworthy with what God has given you? This passage is also about being productive. We don't always like to talk about productivity because we immediately go to like business mind, year-end quarters. But productive, are you being productive in life? Have you been productive in your, your time, your talents, your money God has given you? Your evaluation of faithfulness in the end is going to be connected to your fruitfulness. And the question of what, what do we actually do? The tragedy is that we can do the most amazing things in life. We can have a successful career. We can have the family be educated. We can care for our parents and for people around us. But are they on the things that truly matter? Are, is it all, are we being successful at life on things that truly 
matter. Interesting, I learned something about Billy Graham this week. I didn't know this, but throughout the course of his ministry and his life, he was actually offered millions of dollars, millions of dollars to go and do something else on a number of occasions, apparently. Like something great, something that would have been successful, amazing, but different than what he was doing. Each time Billy Graham said no. And the reason he gave was because he's like, well, my calling on earth is to preach the gospel. To explain the Bible to people was his calling. So in the end, of course I am assuming, but in the end, he gets well done, good and faithful servant. You rejected these things of the world for my kingdom. I'm going to put you over much. What do we do with our time, with our energy that we've been entrusted with? In the end, is it going to be how many people did you, it's, in the end, it's not going to be how many people did you show this to? How many people did you smile at or be really kind to? No, it's going to be what did you do, good and faithful servant, with the money I gave you, the resources, the talents, and that specific wiring I gave to you. God has made us who we are. And we have to be, we've been trusted with this. We've been trusted as the teacher is out of the room, as the master has gone on a journey, and he said he's giving that to us. In the end, he's going to come back. But did we bury it quickly? Because we were really scared and that we didn't want to be judged. Or do we use it to multiply his kingdom, the advancement? Because look at the, war, the reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your, fa your master's happiness. You get to enter into the joy of the master, being thrilled with you. God's desire for us, then, is not this, like, really begrudging submission. The reason he wired you, called you, is the goal, the end goal, is joy. Your ultimate joy, and he knows what's best for ultimate joy. It's like being in a marriage, and like for the past 15 years, and you're like, well, I mean, I took a vow on that wedding day, so I guess, I guess I'm just gonna have to be faithful. I'll just stick it in. I, I'm just like, just gonna mail it in. Like I'm just gonna go right through this. I, I guess I have to be faithful, right? No, no. But like some of us, that's how we actually do our relationship with God, right? We're like, well, like I welcomed you into my life and I said I would follow you. And I mean, my friends and my family, they, they kind of know I go to church and stuff. And so I guess I'm just gonna have to be faithful to you. I'll just keep doing this. That's not the things that bring you joy or delight. And some of us, sometimes, I know I did, you think that God is just against my joy. Well, he doesn't want me to actually be happy. He doesn't want me to have joy. I mean, have you seen what he says about sex? Have you seen what he says about marriage and what I'm supposed to be doing with my money? Like, that's no fun at all. He's saying, be faithful. Be trustworthy to what I have given you because there is joy. We sometimes get a place in our life where we start basing our joy too off of our circumstances. Being trustworthy based on our past experiences of trustworthiness. I Meaning of the house, the car, the job, the kid, the spouse, those are circumstances. But if we actually base our joy off of something that's never changing, God himself, you can be trustworthy to what he has given you because he is trustworthy. The joy is the fact that we get to go to heaven and be with him. You know, it's not really about, like, well, we get to see people that had passed before us, or we get to eat maybe some really good food, or, like, we get to skip down streets of gold. It's not really about that. It's about that we get to spend life with him, with the greatest gift, 
When you get him, you have nothing but joy because that's who he is and that's how he has wired us. Now, is a sermon really a sermon without a Lord of the Rings reference and a C.S. Lewis quote? I think not. So, C.S. Lewis says, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition with infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pleased. Drink, sex, and ambition. Is that what's true joy in the end? I mean, we look at these things and we hold on to them, and God's kind of saying like, hey, you're, you're being a child. Like, have you ever risen, raised a kid or been a kid yourself? Have you ever been a kid yourself? And you have the same routine at bedtime every single day. Brush your teeth, get to bed by eight. Every single day. But every night, it's like, what? I have to go to bed already, but I haven't had my drink yet. Oh, but I haven't had my, like, I haven't had a snack yet. I thought we were going to watch a movie. I can't go to bed now. Like, anybody? <laughs> it's like World War III because you ask them to go to bed at the same time you ask them to go to bed every single night. And so they walk up the stairs and they're like, I hate you. You're the worst. And then the next morning they, they wake up. They're served bacon and eggs and Belgium waffles with a scowl on their face, like, I don't like you. I don't like you. Yet now, they're eating the food that was purchased by someone else. They're underneath a roof that was also purchased by someone else. Sleeping in a bed purchased with someone else's money. See, the third servant does what we often do in our heart. God, I thought you were really mean. I thought you were really mean, so I buried my money in the ground. How many of us have thought or think, well, I want to believe in God because I don't want to be believe in God because like, he's just too mean? Like, there's suffering and there's hurt in the world and famines, and he allows this? Like, I don't like how you run things or demand things of me. I don't like it, so I'm just going to bury my money and I'm going to do what I want with my life. I'm going to get the job I want. I'm going to be the Lord over my life. I'm going to make up this own world view because I don't like you. And God just says, well, here's who I am. This is what I am. And this is who you are. And we think, I don't like how you're coming across. Because forever... <laughs> For whoever has been given more, they will have an abundance because you've been trustworthy with what he has given you in the first place. Because you have been faithful. And I know sometimes it doesn't seem like it. That seems like you're pitching a really long-term goal there. But no, it's now. Because God is trustworthy. His love hasn't changed. His vengeance hasn't changed. His joy hasn't changed. He is trustworthy. And at the end of life, we have to give back what wasn't ours to begin with. We have to give it back to him. We, the servants, serving a great master, caring for his resources while he's away on a journey. Lord of the Rings journey. And we want to do good. We don't want to take the car and smash it through a fence and lodge it between a house and a, a fence, another fence. No, we want to do good. And say, here, 
here's your toy cat back. I took such good care of it. Your resources, they have a purpose. Your time, it has a purpose. Your money has a purpose. Be trustworthy, not only so man can say, wow, that person is really trustworthy, but be trustworthy so God can say, well done, good and faithful servant. I trusted you with a little, and you have proven to be trustworthy. I'm going to trust you with so much more. Come, come, and let, let's celebrate. Come to my happiness. That's what the parable is saying. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, you have trusted us with so much. You have wired each one of us. And you are proud of us. You knew what we were going to do. And you still trusted us throughout it all. Lord Jesus, we come and we just say, Lord, use us. Use my resources. Use my talent. Use my money. Use my time in a way that is honoring and lifts up your kingdom, not my little kingdom. Lord Jesus, may we be seen trustworthy at the end of our lives. May we see that you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord Jesus, as we collect today's tithes and offerings, may you just multiply them. May you just make things grow and more people come to know who you are. More people to come to your kingdom. Because what you have given us, you'll give more abundantly. Lord Jesus, we pray that you multiply it. You multiply our faith in you. You multiply our trustworthiness with what you've given us. And in Jesus' name, amen. So we're just going to send around the tithes and offerings baskets. The first one that comes around will be the Audi basket. So take what you need out of it. The second one that comes around will be the one, the innie basket. So put your tithes and offerings in that. And of course, we do have interna interact and credit at the back if you need that. Thanks so much, guys.